at our Rosh Hashanah morning service, I referenced the movie, You Are So Not Invited to My Bat Mitzvah. Some of you even then went and watched the movie on Netflix that same day and sent me your reviews. Now, admittedly, high art it is not, but it is nice to see not only positive Jewish representation on the screen, but also that there isn't any hint of self-deprecation. All of these Jewish characters are proudly Jewish something which we both strive to embody and teach here at Temple Israel as well. But more on this in a moment. Getting back to the movies, I'll be honest, like so many, we mostly watch our movies via streaming. Growing up, this concept would have been unfathomable to me, as I loved going to the theater. One of my favorite theaters happened to be adjacent to where they used to keep the Goodyear blimp in Houston. It was so cool watching the blimp either take off or land while on my way to see movies like Total Recall and Pretty Woman. Alas, those days are mostly gone. That being said, I did see several movies this summer in an actual theater, including the social media darling Barbenheimer. Now, I didn't see them back to back. I saw them over a couple of weeks. And I felt both would make for excellent High Holy Day sermons. So I submitted my receipts to the congregation. <laughs> now, Barbie is absolutely worth speaking about. But today, I wanted to dive into Oppenheimer, or more specifically, the relationship between the central characters in the movie of J. Robert Oppenheimer and Louis Strauss. Based on the book American Prometheus by Kai Bird and Martin J. Sherwin, I went to the movie thinking it would be focused on the development of the atomic bomb, the Trinity Test. That is certainly a part of the story, but really the movie, spoiler alert, focuses on Oppenheimer's and Strauss's fundamentally different worldviews and how those views not only impacted their relationship, but also their lives. Julius Robert Oppenheimer was born into the Jewish family of Ella Friedman, a painter, and Julius Siegelman Oppenheimer. Robert's father, who came to the United States as a teenager from the King of Prussia, ultimately became a very successful textile importer. He used that wealth to support his family and indulge his two sons. Rather than focus on their Judaism, which they were nominally connected to, Robert's family became involved in the Ethical Cultural Society, and Robert was educated at the Ethical Cultural Society School founded by Felix Adler. This school, whose motto was deed, not creed, placed a tremendous emphasis on personal growth and social transformation. It is quite possible because of these experiences growing up, Robert developed strong progressive leanings, and he at least flirted with socialism and communism, which was at the heart of many pro-worker developments at that time. Now, Strauss, too, was also born into a Jewish family, the son of Rosa Lichtenstein and Louis Strauss, both of whom were immigrants from Germany and Austria. They settled in that Jewish quarter of Richmond, Virginia. Unlike Oppenheimer, Strauss grew up in a proud Jewish home. And as is mentioned by P.J. Grisar in his review of the movie, Strauss was a committed Reformed Jew. He was involved in a dizzying amount of Jewish organizations and even served as the president of Temple Emmanuel in Manhattan for a decade. In his youth, he didn't even work on Shabbat. And later on, Strauss served as an executive committee member of the American Jewish Committee, and he was also active with the Union of American Hebrew Congregations, the predecessor for the URJ. However, unlike Robert Strauss, unlike Robert Strauss took a very different view of communism. Strauss's impressions began with the Polish-Soviet War, 
Upon learning of the Pence massacre, which took place during the war, where 35 Jews meeting to discuss the distribution of American relief aid were summarily executed by the Polish army on the grounds they were Bolshevik conspirators. Lewis pleaded with his boss, President Hoover, to demand an accounting from the Poles. To this end, Hoover spoke to Polish Prime Minister Paderewski, but as Strauss learned, Paderewski was a rabid anti-Semite who believed that all Jews were Bolsheviks and all Bolsheviks were Jews. The massacre, along with the classical dual loyalty trope, led Strauss to not only become a lifelong anti-communist, but also very suspicious of anyone with communist leadings, for he viewed communism as a source, if not the main source, for anti-Semitism. Each of these men, Oppenheimer and Strauss, had a particular view, worldview, that would later play out in how they viewed humanity, socialism, communism, and the Soviet Union, and the bomb. Following the creation of the bomb, Oppenheimer became the most famous scientist in the United States. Fearing the destruction of humanity by nuclear proliferation, Oppenheimer used his pulpit to argue against the creation of the hydrogen bomb and for de-escalation. Strauss, on the other hand, feared the growth of the Soviet Union and fought for both its creation of the hydrogen bomb and against Oppenheimer. He, in turn, argued for nuclear armament. How this plays out, you can see in the movie and read in the book. But it made me begin to think about the central question of how does one approach perceived and actual threats amidst differing worldviews. On Rosh Hashanah, I focused on how we could work together to build new relationships out of a fractured or at least complicated past. But at the same time, it would be a disservice not to acknowledge that the world is changing as well. According to the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, in 2022, they're still tabulating incidents for this year, they tabulated nearly 3,700 anti-Semitic incidents throughout the United States. This is a 36% increase from the 2,700 incidents tabulated in 2021 and the highest number on record since the ADL began tracking such things in 1979. This is the third time in the past five years that the year-end total has been the highest number ever recorded. The dramatic increase in anti-Semitic incidents in 2022 in almost all categories cannot be attributed to any one cause or any one ideology. Significant surges in incidents include high volume increases in organized white supremacist propaganda activity, K through 12 schools and college campuses, as well as deeply troubling percentage increases in attacks on Orthodox Jews and bomb threats towards Jewish institutions, an increase from eight to 91 incidents. Sadly, there have been numerous attempts to disrupt High Holy Day services this year at any number of congregations, an issue which we are well aware, including the use of bomb threats, something that is truly disheartening just as much as it is upsetting. As we know, the world is ever-changing and what is old is often new again. New hatreds begin to emerge both on the right and on the left. But what's different this time is people began to defend old hatreds based on their own personal identification. It is as if many folks are justifying their own team's stance, but are quick to call out the opposition. Both anti-Semitism on the right and on the left are huge problems. However, there is another emergent challenge threatening to undermine our fight against hate, and that is the politicization of anti-Semitism. Or as some argue, join my side because your side 
is the anti-Semitic one. This way of thinking is inherently wrong. As Ambassador Dr. Deborah Lipstadt wrote in her book, Anti-Semitism Here and Now, we must make people aware that anti-Semitism is not solely a problem of the right or the left, but that it exists in both arenas. It might be more institutionalized on the left, but as we are also seeing, it is an element in the rise of right-wing nationalism, both in the United States and abroad. We cannot let those on the left, progressive people who are dedicated to righting long standing wrongs, blind themselves to the anti-Semitism that has tragically insinuated itself into some areas of the political left. Similarly, we must forthrightly acknowledge those on the right who say they are merely, merely trying to protect, quote, European culture as the anti-Semites and the racists that they are. Anti-Semitism is not a left issue or a right issue. It is a human issue. Yes, there is much to fear with increased hatred, and sadly it has both a financial and psychological impact. We are spending so much more of our time, energy, and resources combating this particular form of pernicious hate. But at the same time, we also have many more allies than we have ever had in the past, even if it seems like some of those alliances are frayed. Thankfully, we live in a time and a place where our local elected officials and authorities, for the most part, are on our side. Unlike the recent and not so recent past, it is our police who rushed into the synagogue in the Tree of Life, and they were also there to help free Rabbi Charlie Citron Walker and his congregants in suburban Dallas from a deranged madman. It's also our local Omaha police who are not only present during our High Holy Day services, but who have also helped us work to make our building and make you safer and more secure. To them and to our security forces whose presence here today we are eternally grateful. We have allies, but we cannot rest on our laurels. We cannot simply assume that old alliances withhold, will hold without continuing to foster new relationships. This is why the work of Tri-Faith and the Commons are so important to us locally. Tolerance is not the goal. Rather, we should always be striving towards acceptance, even when we disagree. As Rabbi Berzin spoke about on Erev Rosh Hashanah, disagreements for the sake of heaven can be a reflection of a genuine, authentic relationship. And if we are in relationship with others, it makes it all the more difficult for old hatreds to seep in. And there are so many other ways as well to fight anti-Semitism. But more than that, we also cannot, we must not, give in to despair. As Dr. Lipset argues, we need to reject the victimhood of Judaism. We need to not focus on the oi, but instead find the joy in Judaism. Something we aspire to embody and emulate here at Temple Israel every day. Anti-Semitism may be the world's oldest conspiracy theory. It may be impossible to eradicate. But you know what? We Jews have been around for a pretty long time, too. And we are not going anywhere, either. On this Yom Kippur, this most solemn and somber day of the Jewish year, let us recommit ourselves to standing strong, standing up in the face of hate and intolerance, and standing proud as a Jewish people. In addition, we cannot let our competing worldviews distract us from our larger goals. Due to both their larger-than-life egos and competing worldviews, Strauss and Oppenheimer became bitter enemies. This ultimately damaged each other in ways that became irreparable, which led neither of them to become successful in their larger goals. But what was true for them does not have to be true for us. 
We may not all be united in how we perceive the world, but we can unite around our shared heritage in combating against those who would seek to do us harm. We may not always agree on how to combat ancient and modern hatreds. We may not even agree on their source. But what we can all hopefully agree upon is that our shared legacy to stand with each other in the face of such hatred and instead proudly proclaim, Am Yisrael Chai, the Jewish people live. And if we truly want to be the change we wish to see in the world, then we must stand together, stand tall, and give hate and intolerance no recourse, no sanction. In the words of Barry Wise from her book, How to Fight Anti-Semitism, there are many forces in our world insisting again that all Jews must die. But there is a force far, far greater than that. And that is the force of who we are. We are a people descended from slaves who brought the world ideas that changed the course of history. One God, human dignity, the sanctity of life, freedom itself. That is our inheritance. That is our legacy. We are the people commanded to bring light into this world. And so we shall. Let us commit in this 5784 to stand together and united. We are strong because we are Jews and we will continue to gather, celebrate, observe, live and breathe our tradition no matter what others may try to do to us. It is our prayer that hatred and intolerance forever leave our midst in the year to come. But in case they do not, may we nonetheless be able to stand proudly and tall as Jews as a unified Jewish community, as a unified people who wish to bring our tradition to the world, who wish to bring greater holiness to the world, greater sanctity to the world, greater sense of community to the world, the greater sense of strength to the world that we find when we lift each other up, when we lift our heritage up, when we lift our souls up. To this, we can proudly proclaim, Am Yisrael Chai, the Jewish people live. Shana Tovah.